Welcome to the Artist Spotlight Series with Graph.xyz. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Joel. Appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Look, I'm really excited to introduce you to the Graph community, uh, learn more about your background as a photographer, talk a little bit about your work, your approach, like all these amazing things you do, man. I'm a big fan of your work and I can't wait to introduce you to, let's just say it, the world. Does that work? Um, as many people as it can reach. That'd be wonderful. As many. So uh, how many billions of people do we have on the planet now? I think just over 8 billion, I believe. Eight. Okay. So let's go for seven and a half billion. So we have room to grow. I like it. We'll go for it. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I think a good place to start is like, why photography and what's your backstory? Rather, what's your backstory to your style of photography? Yeah. So a little bit about myself without doing, indulging too much is I moved to Hawaii in 2017 for work. And I actually was most excited about hiking and surfing and enjoying the outdoors. And all I had was an iPhone six and the majority of my memories, I just like to snap a picture, uh, lots of photos. I didn't care too much for videos and they were just for myself and to send back to my parents back home. Um, uh, progressed a couple of years. I've been out there. I've been, I've been enjoying a lot more experienced hikes and, uh, a little more hidden adventures that I was blessed to be able to see. And the iPhone photos were still wonderful, but when I was on Instagram, I would be enjoying particularly people's drone photos, um, really oh, yeah. nice, nice, crispy yeah. drone photos uh, with incredible contrast, just something my phone never really could do. And it was something that I wanted to get into, but it wasn't as much of a passion um, at the time, just because I didn't have time outside of work. I had a full uh, Monday through Friday day, day job. And so weekends I just cared so much about hiking and adventuring that I just took photos here and there. Well, fast forward and the pandemic happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. I had a little bit Call more time story. at home. Yeah. Yep. And so I had always told myself that I was going to get a drone one day. I had had it in my Amazon shopping cart for over two years and I was going to get the <laughs> Mavic, the Mavic Air one. And I was set on it. I okay. had watched every YouTube video that there was uh, analyzing it, dissecting it, comparing it to the competitors. And that's what I was going to get the day that I went okay. to get it without my knowledge. Cause again, I'm not very into the photography world at the time they had just released its, um, predecessor, the Mavic air two. Right. Okay. I was like, okay, it's a little bit more expensive, but I'm usually not the kind of guy that likes to get the newest thing right away. Uh, but I was like, okay, it's going to be an investment I'm spending a lot of money on it. Let's go ahead and do it. And then I spent the next three months in quarantine, watching every YouTube video that I could, learning a little bit more about lighting, angles, time of day to be shooting, framing, everything that I could from an aerial photography standpoint, because it's at this point, mm -hmm. that's really what I cared about. And yeah. then as soon as they lifted the bands on the hiking trails and the outdoors, it was game time. I was out there just bringing it with me with every adventure that I was already normally going to do. And instead of snapping photos with my phone, I would just throw the mm -hmm. drone up and start catching as many photos as I could with that. And quite, quite the passion was born. So if we were to backtrack about 30 seconds, would you say you're more of a landscape specialist or more of an aerial slash drone specialist? Cause I've seen you do both and they both are freaking amazing. I love both. Oh, I appreciate that. My heart is in drone photography, but typically with the drone photography, it is landscape. So I, 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 from time to time with friends or with clients will focus, uh, on a subject a little bit closer up, but I really like mm -hmm. showcasing quite the scene that you normally can't capture from a camera on the ground. Even if it's just about 50, 60 feet up in the air, you can get so much more with the drone. Yeah. I think we've all, you know, had that moment where we're standing on top of a building or, you know, a balcony somewhere or a skyscraper in, you know, Tokyo or some beautiful city. And you kind of have that aha moment mm -hmm. where you're just blown away with what you see. And I think that comes through in your photography. Well, thank you. It's funny you mentioned that. So my brother was living in Taiwan in 2019 and I visited him before mm -hmm. I had gotten a drone. And I was actually on top of Taipei 101, which is the largest building yeah, amazing. in Taiwan. It was stunning. And we hadn't even talked about this before, by the way, about the Tokyo. 
but I saw that. And that was the day where I told myself one day I will have a drone because I want to capture all of this beauty from above, even far higher than where we are right now. And, uh, sure enough, called my brother a year and a half later and said, Hey, guess what I just got. So are you still on the DJI? Is it the one, the air or Mavic air one? I'm kind of butchering the name, but did you graduate? It's okay. To I'm newer model. I'm s- I'm still on the Mavic Air 2, believe it or not. Now I'm on my third one because I've lost two of them in the process of uh, uh, surf, getting uh, the big surf photography. I lost one. I had a a connection error and it went down. And then this last Mm -hmm. winter, I was actually out pursuing a pack of of whales and my battery ran a little bit too low. And I pushed it like that before, but the wind was too strong and I tried bringing it back and it it sank right into the ocean as, as it was coming back. How far away was it when it sank? It was uh, 1,100 meters away. And that one was my fault. The first one, there was a okay. phone connectivity issue. Um, so I don't take credit for that one, but the second one was definitely on me. Okay. We can compare notes later. Um, I had a similar incident in Indonesia, uh, albeit it made it back, but it just skimmed the pool as it was landing on my feet. And it was out a couple kilometers. And uh, same thing, I had sent it out and the idea was, you know, to shoot the lineup. It was beautiful point break. Uh, I won't mention the name, but beautiful point break in Indonesia. You can connect the dots, just epic landscape. I decided to go way out there, you know, let's just see everything. Mm-hmm. And I got the alert that things were gonna go wrong if I didn't bring it back. And I pushed it a little bit too far. And if I had maybe been five or 10 seconds later on the return, it wouldn't have made it. It would have been in the drink. That's enough to get your heart pumping, isn't it? It is. It is. And a good story to share with friends. Oh yeah. It's it's so funny. (laughs) The the day before that I lost my drone, I actually had done the same thing for another pod of, of whales. And my, my drone came back with only 2% battery. It's very similar. It already decelerated. It was in that low power Mm -hmm. mode and it literally just barely inched. It was about to land five feet in front of me and I ran forward and got it at the edge of the, of the water. <laughs> Didn't learn my lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And you got the shot because I've seen it. I did get the shot. For our listeners, go check out Evan's Instagram profile. Uh, we'll drop the links in the show notes later. Uh, but he actually has those shots from the drone that made it home that day. It was, it was stunning. They're beautiful creatures and it's, it's incredible to be able to see both landscape and mother nature in general from just a, such a unique perspective that you wouldn't be able to do, I mean, 10, 15 years ago. And the, oh, the yeah. level of quality that these drones are at, even just five years, in the last five years, the quality is impeccable. So we were really are mm-hmm. in the golden age of aerial photography. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the golden age. I think in five years' time, we'll be saying the same thing. I, you know, sure. We're so early in this. We're early in drone photography, just like we're early in the uh, you know, Web3 NFT space, which we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. So Evan, love the backstory. Got awesome photos. Love that you uh, saved some of your drones and you're only on your third drone now or, or maybe fourth. Um, <laughs> I know you do some planning when you go out for your shoots, but do you consider yourself more of a, you know, a planned photographer where you're looking at, you know, the sun at a certain time of day, the stars, the tides, you know, maybe animal migratory patterns. If you're going out for a specific, you know, whale shoot or dolphin shoot, or are you just kind of shooting from the hip? You know, Hey, I'm going to go out there and shoot something cool. The light looks really epic. What's your bucket? What's your game? I'll say 80% just shooting from the hip. 20% planning because typically the best lighting is going to be golden hour. I like shooting sunrise and sunsets here with the Hawaiian coastlines and the mountainscapes are just majestic with the light that we have. So I like to take it with me everywhere that I go, but I definitely plan on shooting sunrise and sunset every chance that I can, and particularly sunrise because that's when you can avoid all the crowds. Not that many tourists and not that many locals want to get up and crack a dawn to be enjoying these hikes or these landscapes at the same time. So that's the, I'll say 20% of the planning is just, Hey, I got to be up for sunrise and and sun be out for sunset. But then the rest is, I just want to have it in my bag because if the light looks right, it's time to go. Living in Hawaii, getting up for these early AM hikes, you know, you get the blue hour, 
you know, the sun comes up, it meets the horizon. You, you get to experience all that. It's really special. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask you what's maybe the most memorable moment you've had, you know, as a photographer experiencing that time of day, you know, dawn or dusk. I'll try to keep the story short, but this one comes to me immediately. It was over. It was over in Kauai, uh, over on the Nepali coast. Now, if you've ever heard of it, you know, just how incredibly incredible incredibly insane this landscape is it's it's unlike anything that i've ever seen in north america um i know it rivals some stuff over in iceland and some other places in the world if you haven't heard of it mm -hmm. go take a look the poly coast i have some photos that i've shared of it and i'll keep sharing of it but i was actually there during the pandemic they had they had closed down inner island travel you was it was illegal for you to come to hawaii unless you lived here so there was no tourists and they had actually closed down inner island travel. So I was unable to go from Oahu to Kauai for months, but they had just reopened it. So basically there was not that many people traveling at this time. And we had booked our flights about a month prior. And then two days before we had a hurricane threat, which was supposed to actually hit the North shore of Kauai first. And so we ended up not canceling our trip just because we already had the time off from work. We already had the flights and we thought, oh, we'll go ahead and risk it. And if we get stuck inside the hotel the whole week, then we do. But needless to say, the Nepali coast is accessed via foot either from the far north shore on a 12 mile hike, or it's an 11 mile hike one way, so 22 miles round trip. Now we had permits for that, but it had closed. They had closed the, tr the trail because of um, the hurricane. So we had to access it via the road through Waimea Canyon. Now, Waimea Canyon is very similar. They call it the Hawaii's um, Grand Canyon, similar to the one in the mainland in Arizona. And it's just, it's a bunch of riverbeds that have been uh, created over thousands and thousands of years. And it is incredible. But you access it through that. Now, this park, all I'm trying to get to is this park is very busy. It's a very big tourist hotspot. Usually there's a lot of cars, there's a lot of tour buses, and at the Nepali coast, there's typically a lot of hikers that are accessing uh, four or five of the ridges that take you out to it. Now, we got there in the middle of when it was illegal to travel there. They had very little inner island travel, and anybody who had it most likely canceled because of the hurricane. So the day before the hurricane, my best friend and I, his name is Brady, shout out to Brady Thomas, he and I hiked down one of the ridges that takes you out over uh, the Nepali coast. And we saw two people all day in the entire park. Uh, and one of them looked like he was a ranger. He was in a work truck. So there was only one other visiting tour tourist. And I've been back numerous times since then. And it is crazy crowded all the time. So just setting the scene for feeling like we were completely alone in one of the most beautiful places in the world. It, it was in truly incredible. Then we got to the end of the hike, and this was at the very toward the beginning of my my drone days. Um, but we got all the way out there. I was like, "All right, it's time to go." I sent it up, and it was a beautiful landscape, just as anticipated. Had a lot of fun uh, photographing it, getting a couple of videos. We actually packed back, and then the next the next hike, we thought it was going to be uh, a little bit of a journey because it was a four mile just to get to the end of the trail and the sun was going to be setting in about three hours. So we knew we'd be packing back in the dark. Well, we went ahead and did it anyway. And boy, oh boy, was it worth it. There was one of the best sunrises, uh, excuse me, best sunsets I have seen in Hawaii. I have quite a few photos from that night on my Instagram. Uh, and to top everything off, there was a double 270 degree rainbow that almost connected and from the sky. You couldn't see it from the eye down on the ground, but from the drone, the, the, the rainbow almost connected into a 360 degrees. It was about 275 and it was a double. And the outer rainbow was almost just as bright as the inner. And it was stunning. And just getting to experience it completely alone, knowing you're one of the few people that's even watching this uh, right now because everyone's stuck inside because of the pandemic and everything. It was it was stunning. And the photos are a, a living memory for the rest of my life. I think I know the shot. Is it the one that we discussed before that you shared I with me? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That really is amazing. 
Um, the other photos, I'm wondering if I've seen them or not. Are they the ones that look kind of more earthy in tone? Those were from the beginning, the, the earlier part of the day, yeah, where the sunlight was actually a okay. little rather harsh, but mostly clouded out. I'm going to make sure we bring those up on the screen for everybody because they're going to want yeah. to see them. Let's put some pictures to these Take words. Look at them. And to that same extent, I'm thinking about it. The only time that I plan on not shooting, since you had asked, is when it's middle of the day and the sun is incredibly over its overhead and it's just incredibly harsh. That's Typically, the mm -hmm. one time I'll try to avoid just because a lot of the uh, the highlights are pretty hard to, to to make them look good when you're going to edit the photo. Yeah, I mean, I guess if that's all you did and all you really liked was flat photography and everything being blown out, it would work. Correct. If that yeah. was your style. Which some... We're no, not judging. No, and some, sometimes middle of the day adventures <laughs> are the best. I just will keep my drone in my bag until the sunlight gets a little bit better. Well, right on, man. So I think we got a good feel for who you are as a photographer. Um, do you collect photography yourself? I do. I do. I, I like to buy prints from other photographers on okay. Instagram that I've enjoyed their stuff. Yeah. Let me ask you, are there any that you actually, you know, would name? I don't want to name just a couple and to diminish the others because there's so many of them that I do. But uh, one of my really good friends, Walker Johnson, he, if, yeah, if you get a chance to go take a look at his work, it is incredible. He, he has a drone as well, but he also focuses uh, primarily on his handheld, his Sony A4 and shoots incredible portraits. Uh, but his, his passion is also doing landscapes with the camera and the, the lighting the edits from top to bottom are just incredible. He sells his prints on his Instagram, through his Instagram as well. And they're just amazing. And another person I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on is uh, Tom Powers. And I I don't believe that he sells his. However, I have he, he was shooting with the drone here in Hawaii long before I was. And I just aspired so many things that I do now. I aspire to not duplicate, but it definitely motivated me to get similar, uh, similar angles, similar, I guess, directive and trying to be creative and trying new frames. He was just, yeah, a real big motivation and inspiration for me early on. I think I'm going to go talk to him later on and see if we can't get him on the program because uh, it sounds like he might be interested or at least I am anyway. One of the nicest guys you'll ever get to talk to. Hopefully you do. Have you ever bumped into, I'm trying to think of the guy that was a big surf photographer over there in the 90s um had a massive licensing deal he could buy his t-shirts prints all over the world uh, but he was massive in japan while i was there in the 90s uh it'll come back to me i'll drop them in the show notes and, and share it with you um the question i'm trying to get to is have you ever bumped into clark little or, or seen his work yeah he, he doesn't live far down the road from me i live up on the north shore uh, in a town called Wailua. He lives in Haleiwa, right down the street from Katie's break where he shoots oh, the vast majority of his. I ran into him in a Foodland supermarket. Uh, I ran, in, oh, yeah. ran into him one. in the water one time as well. Didn't I, I'm not the type of person that likes to fanboy over somebody and try to go interrupt them and say, hey, I'm, I'm your biggest fan because I'm sure they get that all the time. But gave him a quick hello. He gave me a fist bump in and out of the water. and It was fun to see him work. He, he's behind the scenes, just as impressive as what you see on display and his shops and on the internet too. Yeah. I, I love his work and not to take away from your stuff. Your stuff's awesome. Um, but I discovered him about five years before I discovered you. So just a little bit ahead. Um, so I guess he's somebody to look up to as well. Uh, if I was going to ask you another question, let's say I'm, I'm not a photographer yet. I'm interested in it. I'm kind of like you in 2017, I've got my iPhone six, not 13 let's say it's a six um how do i get started like what do i do well i'm i'm, I'm a pretty big um advocator for it's not about the gear that you have because i'm still shooting with the drone that's about three models too late you know there's four new releases since i've had mine i've had mine for a little over two years i'm still shooting with it i just got my first handheld camera it's a sony a6400 it's a half i mean it's it's a crop sensor so it's not even I mean, it takes great photos, don't get me wrong, but if you're going to be looking to start a photography business, people are going to recommend that you get a full frame or you get a DSLR 
or you get something much higher. You mm-hmm. know, I'm still shooting with a GoPro five, uh, and they are up to a GoPro <laughs> 10 and it's definitely shaped your footage. But if you get better in practice with all of this, you can make it look really, really good. I guess what I'm trying to get at is I would say, just take your photos. Don't worry about what gear you have. If you can invest in some nicer gear, I'd love to give you recommendations, but I started if you scroll back on my Instagram, I was taking photos with an I, with an iPhone, and then I learned how to do editing through Lightroom, uh, Adobe Lightroom Mobile. Mm-hmm. I still edit the vast majority of my photos on Adobe uh, Lightroom on the mobile version, not even on the desktop. Uh, so it's not so much about nice. the gear that you have. In my honest opinion, is it is practice, repetition. Don't take for granted the fact you need to try different perspectives. You need to work on your framing. You do need to take light to consideration because uh, then your photos will be blown out. But just have fun practicing. And you're going to find out quickly the more you take what works for you and what doesn't look good to other people as well. So that leads me to my next question. What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> I love this question because yeah. it used to literally just be a drone that I would carry in my backpack. And it would have its, its own little um, bag that it came with. And I would just put it in the bottom of my backpack and I'd put my snacks my rain gear, my water bottle on top of it. Uh, and it took me forever to get it out. When we get to a place where I wanted to drone, I'd have to take it out. It would take me about six to seven minutes just to unpack it and get it set up. Another three or four mm-hmm. minutes for it to connect to the satellite. So I was not ready to shoot right away. Um, I've had it for about two years now, a little over two years. So I invested in a nice camera bag about six months ago. It's a, a low pro camera bag, I believe 350. And in it, I have the Mavic Air 2 controller mm-hmm. and extra batteries. And then I also have a Sony A6400, which is the prop sensor uh, handheld camera that I was talking about. And then I shoot with a Tamron 17 to 70, which is equivalent to a 25 to 105 on the full frame. So it's a little bit, a little bit more on the telephoto side. So I don't think a really mm-hmm. wide angle. Um, but usually for that, I'm just shooting run and gun. I pull it out real quick if I want to take some photos. But if I had my choice, we get somewhere, the landscape looks beautiful, the lighting is great, I'm going to the drone. Is there anything that we wouldn't expect you to have in your uh, in your goodie bag, in your tool chest? Well, for being a, primarily a photographer, you probably wouldn't expect that I actually also have an FPV drone as well. And I don't use it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't okay. I don't use it all that often. Most people who are FPV pilots, they're very well known for being an FPV pilot. They fly it all the time. They're into the crazy acrobats, the near misses, the turning, the flipping, all that. I like to have it to complete a cinematic story, but it's not my primary focus. So I, I do have the DJI FPV. And I recently got a GoPro mount to put on top of it to get a little less uh, shaky footage and higher quality video so really cool so um fpv drone i'm trying to figure out how you would you know explain that to somebody that wasn't familiar with it i mean basically you put on the goggles Mm -hmm. and you have first person view that's the fpv part of it of what's happening on the drone so you essentially are blind to the world around you and your line of sight is whatever the drone would see at its elevation at its velocity yeah it's, right. it's, it's almost as if you've ever played one of those virtual realities where you're in a simulator. So you're, yeah. you're in one of those, like the OcuSync, I believe. I've never used them, but I've seen people who use the OcuSync uh, goggles. But you can control it. It's not on an axis. Um, so it's not actually, it's not a stabilized drone. So it's not going to always mm-hmm. recenter it completely turns. It can do flips. It can do barrels. It can side roll. It can dive down a cliff. It can shoot up to the sky really. And it's so much faster. I mean, they go up to 90 miles per hour if you're in full net wow. macro mode. Wow. A uh, whole lot more laws you have to worry about not breaking when you're flying those. So I try to stay away a little bit. I can imagine you can't, you don't want to buzz any freeways or, you know, military bases that you have out there with sure. that type of equipment. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to share a link to um, an FPV drone video that my buddy just shot uh, this last week. I won't mention it on the podcast. I'll just share it in private after with you. But really just amazing footage of flying through the forest and around cliffs and uh, all chasing a mountain biker uh, through the terrain. Impressive. 
Yeah, it's seriously impressive. I'll share that after with you. Um, really cool, man. Really cool. So since we're on the topic of tech and all things interesting, um, NFTs. Uh, we're there. We're an NFT platform. We're trying to bring artists, photographers like yourself into the NFT space, um, providing them with the platform and, you know, the technology and the marketing and everything to get their, you know, probably their first uh, NFT drop into the hands of collectors and doing prints as well. So it's kind of a hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. My question to you, my friend, is what do you think about all this NFT mumbo jumbo? <laughs> it's very exciting. And I couldn't be happier that you reached out to me with this opportunity because it's something that I've been very interested in doing myself. But the, the entry has been, I'm not a huge tech guy. I'll be very honest. I usually have to read a manual for quite a while. And I got to call tech support if something goes wrong. I mean, it took me forever just to switch over from uh, PC to Mac and cursing every day, wanting to go back. So it was something that I was looking forward to do, but it was still a little bit of a barrier to entry that I wasn't familiar with. But with that being said, I mean, just being on Instagram, you see how prevalent it is today. There are so many top artists that I follow and aspire to be that have been releasing NFTs and there's been such a demand for it. When I first heard of it, I was a little bit, I could see where the supply would want to come from, but I was, mm -hmm. I was a little hesitant to see, would there be a demand? Would there be a, a desire for it? And the overwhelming answer with the creators that I follow who have been selling theirs is that yes, there's people that want to yeah. own that art, myself included for other artists that I aspire to be. I think, man, how unique would it be? to be the only person or be one of the few that has the rights to this or, or has this. It's like when you walk into, I was actually, I was over in Maui, uh, on the island of Maui in September. And I went into an art studio, uh, in Lahaina. Mm -hmm. And this artist was incredible. You could tell he probably took him two or three months to, to paint these pieces of art. And each of them were sold. There was either one or five pieces total. And so there was, yeah. there was a strong desire. Now, because of that, the price tag on the art was a little bit out of reach for myself at the time being, but it was something like, man, if I want, when I get a house, this is the kind of centerpiece art that I would like to have. And you do feel a little bit exclusive knowing that I would be one of only one person or one of five people that even has yeah. this piece of art in general. Um, and so if you don't think I didn't start a saving fund right away, you'd be wrong because I was excited about that. <laughs> Gotta get the house first. Well, hopefully we can help you. Gotta get the house first because yeah. I don't think it would fit on the wall right here. Let's um let's plan an epic NFT drop later this summer and uh hopefully help you with at least a down payment or something. <laughs> I mean that's that would be wonderful. But yeah, I'm I'm just excited to to get my art out there in another form to some people that may not already be familiar with my work. I, I've always been really passionate about just sharing God's beautiful creation that I'm able to see every day you know it's kind of one thing that i can do to show my friends and family back home and the people that i meet like a simple reminder sometimes to get out and enjoy the smell of outdoors get out and, and enjoy yeah. an adventure and enjoy the beauty that we have because this world is full of so much negativity and so much pain and so much hurt i think we can all agree on that especially right now but one thing we can also agree on the other side is there's so much beauty that this world has to offer and a lot of it sometimes just is is stepping outside and I know a lot of people, they, they aren't able to go outside as often as, I, as I'm able to. And some people don't have the time or the ability sometimes to, to see um, the world through a lens that the drone allows me to be able to see it. So I love being able to share that. And the more people that can get their hands or their eyes on just the beautiful sights of this world, that's what it's all I'm about. You know, something that art inherently does, photography especially, is it shows you know, the outdoors and a light that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily have access to, mm -hmm. right? If you're living in a city or a heavily urbanized area, or it's just a different part of the world that you've, you know, maybe it's difficult for you to get to because of whatever reason, right? Quarantine or something else. Sure. I think we all just went through that. So it provides a really nice escape. I think what the NFT space does for us is, you know, it certainly opens up the doors to other types of collectors, let's call them. Um, but I think there's, there's a segue, there's a, there's a place where it forks between 
moving away from my mic here, you won't hear me. Um, things kind of fork, right? You have the traditional art collectors, let's have a beautiful print, limited run, hang it on the wall, hopefully hang it on the wall. That's what it's meant for. I'm terrible. All my art's rolled up in tubes still, has been for years, um, hence the black walls. But, you know, you have the traditional, you know, collector on one side, and then on the other, you have the digital collector, right? These are the NFT collectors. And what the NFT does is it allows all these things that we talk about, like provenance and proof of custody and or chain of custody and proof of ownership and, you know, all of these things that are that are wonderful, right? Royalties that go back to the original creator. Um, this is something that was impossible until very, very recently, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. If my NFT history and trivia is correct, I think it was around 2017 the first NFTs were were issued. I believe they were the crypto punks and you know they were very cheap at the time and now they're you know six figures and seven figures per per punk, mm -hmm. you know. Um and on the back side of that, there's an amazing community that's sprouted up. Right. And it's a community that's been with it since the beginning of the project and what we're hoping to do with Graph is really do the same for the photographers, give them access to a new community mm -hmm. and not necessarily our community, but open up the door so they can create that digital community of collectors. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just talking with uh, some people that are close to me, uh, a little bit older of a demographic, and they were interested in hearing about what NFTs were because they weren't familiar. Now, they're not they're not very into their technology and stuff. So I was trying to explain to them that they're their hesitancy was, well, it's not something that I've heard of. How would you want something that's digital? And I basically like to explain it as, well, the internet was a very wild idea to push to the world at one point as well. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies was a very wild idea too. And we are still at the very beginning of that. And it's, it's becoming a little bit mm -hmm. more well-known, but I feel like it's one of those things that if you don't get it on it now, you'll just be late to it when you come around to it later. And it's, it's a very unique uh, time. And one thing actually that I'm pretty passionate about in sharing and talking to you about today is particularly with, with my photography being aerial and drone photography. Uh, we're in a time in, in, in society right now where drone regulation is becoming uh, far more restricting. You know, they have more mm -hmm. geofencing. They're, they're adding laws by the month in your both municipal and city and state as well as federal laws of what you can fly. And the it's a lot harder to get into aerial because you have to get part 107 uh, with the FAA here in the United States. A lot of yeah. countries don't allow drones at all. Some drones are only allowed in certain sizes. So what I'm trying to get at is it's a very unique time for myself because I'm able to take these photos with fewer restrictions. I think in five years from now, drone photography may be very difficult. Uh, there might be a lot of borders to get into and there are yeah. some places where you genuinely cannot fly and take photos of which i'm able to right now and so it's it's pretty cool to think hey some of the photos that i've already taken or that i will take in the next couple of months or even a couple of the ones that i'm going to showcase in this nft launch i don't think you'll be able to drone legally in these locations in the next five years so you could be holding on to a piece of art that is Literally, you're not able to duplicate, let alone the lighting, but you're just genuinely not legally allowed to fly there anymore. So it's kind of a, a cool thing to know that I'm able to experience right now and then also to possibly get your hands on a piece of art that you cannot duplicate later down the road. 100% agreed. Um, experienced the same myself trying to fly a drone off of our West Coast here in Canada. And our West Coast has airports littered all over it, at least the places that are accessible by car mm -hmm. uh, are close to airports. And uh, right away, geofencing kicked in and wasn't even able to take off the last time I brought out the drone. Right. So to your point, uh, things are becoming more restrictive. And, you know, I would agree in two, three, maybe four or five more years, uh, drone photography is going to be a, a place that is, what should I say, um, almost impossible to embark on. You know, it's not going to be accessible to get permits unless you can. Yeah. I mean, you can go out and rent a helicopter and a pilot for a few hours. And uh, it's a different barrier of entry again. Sure. You know, it's it's deep pocketed. Sure. I mean, similar. In, I mean, I know that Canada, I've never, I haven't been to Canada as an adult, but I know that my friends that live there, they say it's very hard to fly drones up there because of the laws. And in 
United States national parks. It's yeah. not allowed anymore. So anybody who had photos back from 2017 or prior in any of the national parks, I mean, mm-hmm. holding on to a gym because it was taken at a legal time and, and YouTube or whatever site can't come after you and send you the FAA. Yeah. So I imagine the uh, collectability score of your pieces will be going up. I, I do believe so. And that's one thing that excites me about NFTs, both for myself and other creators at this time particularly when it does come to aerial. We'll have to create some sort of index to map that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they got new headlines on the news every couple of weeks with somebody doing something silly with a drone and getting the rest of us in trouble. Oh yeah. Yeah. It happens. Um, so Evan, this has been great. I, I want to be cognizant of our time here. We've already been on the clock for 40 minutes or so. So thank you. Yes, sir. Um, but before you go, I got a couple of quick questions for you. We're going to put you on the hot seat Want to answer these as fast as you can. All right. I got a couple quick answers. Let's do it. And they can be anything. Nikon or Canon? Sony. Nice. Digital or film? Digital. Of course. Best kind of photographer? Aerial. Worst kind of photographer? Film. Don't hate me for that one. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Or, or maybe not. And so I have some friends that shoot film, and I, I'm, not, I'm just picking on them a little bit. Same with Sony. Uh, excuse me. Same with Nikon shooters. Just friendly, friendly picking on them. We love everyone. A final question. Yes. Favorite up and coming, soon to be released photo NFT platform. Oh, it's Graph without a doubt. Yeah, Graph. So that's G R double A P H. All caps. Y Z. All caps. Right. We'll drop that in the show notes later. Um, anything else, Evan, before we let you go? No, sir. I think that's about it. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to bring me on. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to what's to come. A lot of the art that you're going to see coming from this launch is going to hold a lot of a lot of uh, passion in in what I do, where I've come, how far I've come, and you're going to get to see some stuff that nobody's seen before. You're going to get to get to own some things that nobody may ever own again because I'm planning on I'm actually planning on traveling the world a little bit in the next couple of months, and so I might not be here in Hawaii for for a while. Uh, so it's going to be very unique. It's going to be very special for me, and I hope you love it. Well, we can feel the passion and uh, I speak for myself. But hopefully I speak for everyone. Really looking forward to seeing the drop. Guys, we're going to have another follow-up interview with Evan closer to the drop when we have a few more details. There'll be some sneak peeks in there. So make sure you subscribe to our channels, whether that's the podcast or our YouTube series. Follow us on Twitter, all the socials, right, for the latest. Um, Evan, again, thank you. And I look forward to seeing the story unfold with you. More than welcome, Joel. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Aloha.